Well, good morning again. Uh, wonderful to see you and be back with you. Um, quick shout out to Pastor Marty. Did another wonderful job last week uh, covering and uh, giving you guys the second edition of the sermon series that we're in called Kingdom Stories. And uh, so today will be the third part. If you missed any of those messages, you can always go back online to gstx.org, hit sermons, and uh, uh, you, can, you can get to that page. But we're in this series talking about uh, these stories, otherwise known as parables. And in each parable, we find something out that Jesus is revealing to us about a heavenly truth that he wants us to know about, or about his kingdom and how to grow in the things of God. So I want to start today with a question. What's the key in growing in the things of God? What's the secret? What's the key? Do you know? Some people will say that it's an intellect thing, that you need to know all the right religious answers, and that's the key to growing in the things of God. Some believe that it's more of an experiential thing. Uh, you need to have a profound personal encounter with the divine, and then you grow. And still others say it's a morality thing, that God loves to bless those who know how to follow the rules. I'm here to, today to tell you, perhaps what is no surprise to you, that it's not any of those things. None of those things are the key in growing in the things of God. What Jesus tells us today in the parable of the sower is that the key to growing in the things of God involves your heart. It's a heart thing, Okay. Look at what Jesus says, uh, and he tells a story about an extravagant gardener called the sower. In Luke 8, it says, while a large crowd was gathering and people were coming to Jesus from town after town, he told them this parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path. It was trampled on, and the birds ate it up. Some fell on rocky ground, and when it came up, the plants withered because they had no moisture. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up with it and choked the plants. Still other seed fell on good soil, and it came up and it yielded a crop a hundred times more than what was sown. So here's a guy who wants to plant a massive garden. And so he has this bag full of seeds, and he's taking these seeds and he's just throwing them without a care in the world, really, right? Casting it all throughout his field. He's throwing it everywhere. You know what it reminds me of? Have you ever thrown some seed ever in your life? Maybe you have. Uh, when you throw seeds, it, it really can get everywhere, can't it? It reminds me as a kid, I, I went to a couple of weddings where as the bride and the groom are leaving, you grab some bird seed or some rice, and as the bride and the groom, they, they come out and they're leaving, you throw it up in the air, and man, that stuff gets everywhere. <laughs> Doesn't I remember as a kid, I'd go home and I'd find some in my shirt and later as I was uh, changing or in my, my shoes even. I mean, it really, it just gets everywhere. But this gardener here today in our story, he's kind of doing the same thing. He's taking handfuls of seed and he's just throwing it. And it's going everywhere. Why is he being so extravagant with the seed? Well, it's because he wants to see as much fruit grow as possible. It's all about the fruit. He wants to see an abundance of it. And Jesus tells us that some of the seed, it falls on good soil, but most of the sea, seed fell in unhelpful and unfruitful places, right? So what's the meaning of this parable? Jesus is kind enough to tell us this morning that the seed is the message of the kingdom. Really, it's the word, right? The message of Jesus, in the New Testament, and in the Gospels in particular, whenever you hear reference to the Word, it's always Jesus, who He is, what He's done, what He's promised, what's possible now for you and I in and through Him. And so the sower is God the Father in this parable, taking the message of Jesus and sharing it as far and as wide with as many people as possible in as many places as possible. And the soil is not actually soil, but it's human hearts. And some of our human hearts are ready and open and receptive, but a great deal more are not. And the question that you and I are meant to wrestle with when we hear this parable is, what kind of soil am I in right now? What kind of heart do I have? Do I have a heart that, that is ripe and ready and receptive for the message of Jesus to hit and to do its work over and over and over again over the course of my life? Each and every time that the word of Jesus hits my heart, it might hit good soil. 
It might take root and form deep roots. It might bear beautiful fruit. The fruit of knowing that you're forgiven of every sin, the the fruit of knowing that you're filled with God's own spirit within you, the fruit of knowing that your future is secure, the fruit of a result of those things, of going out and risking it all to serve and give in Jesus' name to other people. Is my heart ready to receive? Well, let's find out, okay, this morning, shall we? Jesus says that some of our hearts are just hard. Jesus' words, not mine. That's what he says. Look again how he puts it in the context of our parable. A farmer went out to sow his seed as he was scattering the seed. Some seed fell along the path, the well-trampled path, right? It's really hard. And the birds just came and ate up the seed. So the hard-hearted person is the person, you know, who's kind of feeling themselves, if you will, in this life. This is the person who is full of pride, the person who's saying, you know what? I don't need for much in this life. I'm pretty confident in my own skills, that I got. I'm competent as a person. I don't need to lean upon or call upon God for much. The hard-hearted person is a person who needs nothing from God. And as a result, when that message goes out about who Jesus is, it just kind of hits the hard heart, the hard path, and it falls off and it sits on the surface. It doesn't penetrate the soil because it's hard. And it says the birds come and just eat it up, as Jesus says. They just take the seed and fly away with it. So a quick little check to see if we are a hard-hearted person. If you've been sitting here this morning and the entire time you've been shaking your right leg 90 miles per hour, uh, try to see if you can make this worship go quicker. Or if you checked your phone 14 times in the last 15 minutes, or if you already rolled your eyes at what I'm saying right now, then maybe God's saying you have a hard heart. Maybe you're just self-sufficient. You don't need this place, you don't need these people, you don't need this experience. And I get it, but you also might be on the well-trotted path, Jesus says. You might just be on hard soil. Jesus says some of us, some of us have shallow hearts or superficial hearts. And this is how he puts it again in the context of our parable. He says other seed fell on rocky ground where they did not have much soil. The shallow-hearted person is the person who will only let God go so deep with them. You see, they're all about the good things of God. They're all about the feel good moments with God. They want God to be in work at work in their life, but only insofar as it makes life better and not harder. You see, as soon as it involves addressing the difficult things, the tough issues, or turning over to the other side and discovering all that nasty stuff underneath, and then applying God's truth to that, we want no part of it. All of a sudden, when it gets hard in the context of our faith, we clam up and we want to run away. The shallow-hearted person really only wants the good things from God. And when it starts to get tough in the context of your faith, what happens is you actually end up turning away from God and saying, well, this isn't really working out the way that I wanted it to in my life. My life is not blessed in the way that I thought you should bless it, God. I'm not feeling good all the time like I want to feel. You're making things more complicated for me, God. I'm blaming you, God. And because life is not easy, my faith is going to wither now and I'm going to turn back and go the other way. That is a shallow-hearted person because the sun comes out and it scorches that person who's bearing some fruit, but they've got no root system. They wither away because, again, they don't want to go deep with God. They don't want to apply the truths of Jesus to the hard parts of life at all. That's what Jesus would say is a shallow-hearted person. Quick check, maybe this is you this morning. When life gets difficult, what happens to your faith? Do you lean in to the person of Jesus? Do you run towards the promises that are yours in Jesus? Or do you find yourself stepping back, getting mad, shaking a fist, and turning the other way? If when life gets difficult, you find yourself running, you might just be on rocky ground. And then Jesus says, there are some who have divided hearts. And he says in Luke 8, 7, other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and with it choked the plants. I believe this is probably the most common heart condition. You have some divided loyalties, okay? The person with the divided heart, they know they need from God. Uh, They're open to it. They need the good things. They need God to work even in the bad things. But the problem is they want Jesus among many other things. The person with a divided heart, Jesus has never really lured long enough or deep enough in any significant way to get a say 
over their life. And so the message of Jesus gets choked out by all these other urges and all these other impulses and influences. I want you to imagine just for a second, if you will, inside your heart, there's a boardroom. Okay. Got that pictured? A giant oak desk, some water bottles in the middle, fancy whiteboard on the wall, that black swivel chair that squeaks all the time that nobody wants to sit in, right? But around that table are not the CEO, the CFO, the COO, or any other C in the company that you work with, but around that table are all of your interests, okay? It's your own personal internal board of directors. That's who's sitting around that table. And you have your professional self seated at that table, of course. You have your financial self seated at the table, your family self, your fun-loving self, right? Your sexual self is seated at that table. All of it is there. You're all arguing back and forth. Not much ever gets done. They all have their own agenda, their own urge, their own impulse, and there's no cooperation or collaboration at the table, The person with the divided heart, they want Jesus in their life, but they do not want him to be the chair of the table. They don't want him sitting in that prime spot at the head of the table. They want to give him merely just a seat at the table. And so he becomes one voice among many, and his will and his truth and his ways are often, if not easily, drowned out by all the other urges and and instincts and impulses and agendas. You see, those are those thorns that Jesus is talking about in this parable. Quick check. If you're a person with a divided heart, ask yourself this. When's the last time that you let Jesus change your plans? When's the last time you had something that you wanted to do, that you were set on doing, it felt right to do, and then all of a sudden maybe you got convicted a little bit or corrected by another person? You could sense this was God Right, the power of the Holy Spirit moving in you towards a different thing of God. The things of Jesus that he wants you to step into, right, in his kingdom. And so actually, you actually changed your course. You changed plans to be more in line with what you thought might actually be the will of God. You didn't do what you wanted, but instead you walked in the way that you knew you should. You see, if Jesus never has a chance to change your plans, if he never has a chance to stand up at the table and say, hey, I'm the CEO of your soul, then maybe, just maybe, he's one voice among many in that boardroom. Maybe you've got some thorns growing and you have a divided heart. Now let's talk about good soil. Jesus does talk about some hearts that are good soil, some hearts, that is, that are soft. Some hearts are receptive to the message of the kingdom. And when the message of Jesus hits that heart, it burrows deep and it forms this lasting root system. And the faith that forms and the fruit that comes up is strong and it's plentiful. This is a person who is likely walking around with a constant sense of reality of who they are. That in light of Jesus, they're well aware that they are a mess. And they are in need of the one who has given his mercy and his grace to them. This is a person who in many things is not asking the question, what do I feel like doing? What do I want to do? But instead is motivated by God's spirit. And you see sign of the fruit of God's work in their life. They're asking questions more like this. What can I do that is most glorifying to God and most loving to others? You see, that's the value set of the kingdom. That is what happens when there's a soft heart, a heart receptive and ready to receive this message of Jesus. Now, a moment of total honesty and transparency with you. My heart is not often in this good soil. My heart is not often as soft as what it needs to be. And if we were being honest with each other and I sat down with you and we had some coffee And we talked, and again, we were being really honest with one another. And I'll say to you, you know, this is how I'm processing um, what this parable is saying. My heart isn't all that soft, all that much. And then if you were being real honest, you'd be like, you know what? Me too. (laughs) Me too. My heart is often divided. My heart is often shallow. It only wants the good things. And I'll be like, you know what? Same for me. And then you'll lean over to me and you'll say, Pastor Stephen, well, what do we do about that? How do our hearts become ripe to receive the message of Jesus? 
How can our hearts be kept in good soil so that over and over again this message can burrow deep and form great roots, bear great fruit, and transform our lives? And what I'll do is I'll lean over to you and be like, I got an answer for you. You're just not going to like it. We're going to need another cup of coffee. <laughs> okay. You see, seven, eight years ago, I went to St. Louis to start my, my seminary uh, training, if you will. And part of orientation that weekend, we had a day of service. Uh, they divided up all the students, and we went into the surrounding communities of St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, we went to complete a project. I'm not sure where I am in that picture, but I promise you I am in there. <laughs> some of the students got to go to some inner city schools and paint some classrooms, Others got to help build a house for a family that was in need. I was in a group that got to go to a community garden of sorts that was way overgrown and needed some much TLC. And so I have this memory of that day, not only of getting bitten by more mosquitoes than I could ever imagine. I'll never do gardening work without jeans on again. But this vision of a rototiller and a cultivator, something to rip up the ground Right? And I got to borrow that. And I don't care if you're nine years old or 29 years old, getting to use that kind of machinery, it was fun, okay? I had to learn how to use it first. That was the thing. It's just these giant blades that are spinning and they're eating up the ground, right? So I have this image in my mind of one of the seminary staff who had been gardening for years. He was leading our service group that day, and he's standing behind this rototiller, and he's just moving it, and it's ripping up the ground, and he's making these deep tracks in the garden so that we could plant in there. But we weren't ready yet after he did that. No, it's only one step, right, to rip up the soil. Then we had to get some stuff to add the good bacteria to the soil, so we got uh, this big bag of fertilizer, and we worked it into the soil, but we st still were not done. We had to add some water in there. And then, and only then, was it ripe soil for planting, which struck me as a ton of work for tomatoes and carrots, right? That's whatever else we were planting that day is mostly things that you could go to the grocery store and buy, but hey, we were gardening, right? And my point is this. It's an unpleasant process that takes place when hard soil is turned into good soil, okay? It's not a process that you do. It's a process that God does to us. And how do you think he's going to take the hard soil of your heart and turn it into good soil? You know what he's going to do? This is the part that you're not going to like, okay? He's going to let the rain fall. He's going to let the rain fall. He's going to let the blade work. He's going to let some of that stuff that you'd rather keep out of your life to not deal with in your life, he's going to let it be worked in and through the ground, and this is how hard soil becomes good soil. He's not going to let the sun shine on it all the time on hard soil. What does that make it? it makes it even harder, doesn't it? He's going to let tough things and difficult things hit you and happen to you and work their way through you. And this is how in a sinful, broken, and backwards world, this is how he turns hard soil into good soil. And as he does this, this is not him breaking you down. Hear me when I say that this morning. This is not God breaking you down. You have to see it this way. It is him breaking you open so that the truth of who Jesus is can be planted deeply within you. It's him breaking you open so that the truth of Jesus can be planted deeply in you. So what's he going to do? He's going to use the truth of his law to convict us, right, of all the dumb things that we're doing, those things that are displeasing to God, those things that we know we shouldn't be doing, and he's going to let the dysfunction of this world at times do a number on us so that we can see our own weakness, our own frailty, and our own mortality. He's going to let the pains of this world at times upend you so that you can see your vulnerability and your need for him. And again, it's not him breaking you down. It's him breaking you open so that the truth of Jesus, the truth of God's love for hard-hearted, shallow, and divided people, me included in this, might be placed deep, deep, deep within us over the course of our lives. And he's going to do it over and over and over again. So if you're here today, and this idea of growing in the things of God, of having a greater sense of your own forgiveness, a greater confidence in your future in his family, a greater manifestation in your life of what are called the fruits of the Spirit, right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. All these things, if you like that idea of more of the stuff of the kingdom in your life, then this parable today is an invitation to you. An invitation to you where you are encouraged. 
you're encouraged to, towards three things. The first thing I would say is to not resist the cultivating work of God, okay? Do not resist or run from some notion that some of the difficulties in your life, the hard things, those things that you don't want to address can be and will be used by God for his purposes. That he can be up to something in those times where you think that it's hard, when it seems unfair. Resist the urge of the shallow faith that says, unless it feels good or makes immediate sense to me in the way that I see the world, that I want no part of it. Resist that urge. Resist the urge and do not resist the cultivating work of God. But instead, reset your expectations. Reset your expectations about what life should look like as a follower of Jesus. See, God is going to use some of the difficult things in our life to break us open so that you can see for yourself who you really are, so that the soil of your soul can be thoroughly tilled and the message of Jesus might burrow its way deeper and deeper inside your heart each and every time that it's proclaimed to you. See, God's at work in those things and he's making you ready to receive the greatest of things. And in those moments, and maybe this is where you're at today, in those moments where you feel broken open by life, and you are well aware of just how desperately you need the work of Jesus in your life. When you're at your ropes end, your wits end, whatever end it may be in those moments, return to and rest in this message of God's love for you. In those moments, you're going to run to something. And God's saying, run to the truths that sound like this. I can't, but Jesus can. I won't, but he did. I'm weak, but Jesus is strong. I'm sinful, but Jesus is forgiveness. I'm dying, but Jesus is life. And I'm lost, but in Jesus I'm found. Let that message hit you deep in the broken open place. And that's how God does his work. See, Jesus loved to tell stories about seeds and soil. I think it was because he knew that we could grasp it. We could understand it. We could relate to it. We would get it. But I also believe that it's because Jesus sees himself as a gardener. Think about it in the book of Genesis with me. Beginning of the whole thing, right? God creates all that we see. He creates it all by speaking it into existence. But then in Genesis 2.8, it says that God, a physically present God in this new created world, plants a garden. The Hebrew word there is natah. Same word used when Noah plants a vineyard in Genesis. Same word used when Abraham plants a grove in Genesis. And what we believe is that this is the pre-incarnate Jesus here. This is, Jesus is the one that shows up in Genesis chapter two, verse eight, and he plants a garden. Now, prior to this, all the creating work had been done by speaking, right? Let there be light, and there was light. Let there be animals, and there's a crocodile, right? But at this moment, Genesis 2.8, it says that God plants. And the implication is God has gone from just speaking things into existence into being in creation itself, on hands and knees, digging the holes, planting the seed, di dirt under his fingernails, planting, cultivating a garden. And I imagine it looked even better than this one because the garden that Jesus was planting, we know as the garden of what? Eden, this beautiful, immaculate, well-prepared place for his creation. And that just got me thinking last night. As I was putting together this message, how much care God takes for us, that he thinks about where we're going to live. He provides for us in every single way. I started thinking, John 14, where the disciples are scared about Jesus leaving and going to heaven, not knowing the way. He says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through me. And if I go and I prepare a place for you, surely I will come back and take you to be where I am. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. If that were not so, I would have told you, he says. Take comfort that God has always and will always prepare that special place for you. And he has a place right now prepared for you whenever he comes to take you to be with him. We can rest in that promise. We see it all the way back in the beginning in Genesis. But what ended up happening in that garden, right? Mankind rejected the leadership of God over its life. 
and they were kicked out of the garden, but God did not give up his gardening work. No, he shifted it from plants to his lost people. And now what he's doing is he's taking different kind of seed and he's scattering it throughout all the world. He's trying to get it to hit the hearts of his people. Why? Because he loves you. And now you and I, we are the thing that he's molding and he's shaping and we are the work of his hands and we are receiving that message and then growing in that faith, believing that you're loved and knowing that the God of the universe has done everything to bring you back to him. See, that's the garden that he's cultivating now through Jesus. Jesus is the great gardener and the faith that he's gifted you with is the thing that he's growing that's bearing much fruit. But here's how it's going to work. You and me, We have to trust him. We have to trust him to do his work in our lives. He has to till the soil of our hearts. And our prayer this morning is that you let him break you open again and again and again so that the truth of his love can take root and that it will continue to take root in your life. That's our kingdom story for today, one that God does not want us to forget. In Jesus' name, amen.